Hello and welcome everybody, I'm One Proud Bavarian and today I want to give you a quick rundown about the most important aspects of the newly announced Crusader Kings 3 that you need to know about, as well as some stuff that hasn't made it outside of the convention yet. This video in particular focuses on only the most important elements of what we know so far. I was lucky enough to be able to attend PDXCon in Berlin, and while Paradox kinda never got back to me in regards to a press pass, I did have many opportunities to ask holes into the developers behind the upcoming iteration of the best grand strategy series of all time, Crusader Kings. What we know about this game so far is that it will be released in 2020 and that the game director is the same as for CK1 and CK2, Henrik Fahus, also known as Doomdark. He has a lot of experience not just in having a vision for this game, but also in the technical side of it, seeing as he has a programmer background. The game will be running on Paradox New Yomini layer for the Clausewitz engine and has been in development longer than Imperator. The state of the game judging by the existing screenshots already looks well into the development but let's hope that release won't be that far back in 2020. We also know that they have decided to exclude some old features of CK2 in the new game, such as Merchant Republics, Nomad as a Government Form and Societies. The reason for this is that all three of these examples are systems they dislike and want to rework entirely in later updates. I was lucky enough to talk to Wiz who created Stellaris in Berlin and he shared an idea that I also share. If one wants to make a new iteration of a game that had 7 whole years of support, it's necessary to cut out whatever features were mediocre, keep whatever is good and then reinvent new features to make the jump to a new version truly worthwhile. Societies, merchant republics and nomads were for example all clunky and because of it I had to go in favour of being reinvented later on. In my opinion this is the correct choice, although of course it brings less variety when the game is released. On the other hand, however, they stuck to the main ideas of CK2 in its current form. All religions will be playable at launch, the game works with money, prestige and piety as its main resources, and the focus of the game is on roleplay rather than winning. This shows in particular when looking at something that developers on the ground told me that hasn't really made the rounds yet. Character moods. While I don't know all that much about this feature yet, it seems to me as if the next step of creating realistic NPCs that interact with the player was a piece out of the Sims playbook. Supposedly, characters will now have moods that influence their interests and how they view the player and other characters. We already know that the developers want to work with fewer traits than in Crusader Kings 2, but the traits themselves are supposed to influence characters stronger than before. Now, with moods being something that influences the immediate behavior of the AI, it won't just be enough to hand out counties to content characters and ignore them for the rest of their lives, because they might one day decide that one county just isn't enough for them. To me, Moods is one of the biggest expansions on the old system of character relationships possible, because it makes NPCs much more flexible and brings much needed variety. Additionally, character relationships in a hierarchic structure are gaining an additional layer via a rumored respect or fear mechanic. It is already in the UI but has not been confirmed in detail. Being a ruthless, cruel or outright mad character was really difficult in CK2, because NPCs only knew love or hate for the player, it was either plus 100 or minus 100, or anything in between of course, but nothing on the side of it. By expanding on this relationship system with the help of a fear factor next to the relationship factor, even a ruthless king might survive instead of getting insta-killed. If he is able to inspire enough fear in the hearts of his servants, he will have a long reign. The small revolution that happens because of this feature means that an entirely new way of roleplaying will now become available, with fear actually being a factor. Some changes we can also already make out from the screenshot provided to us are that baronies are now all on the map. However, I already want to dampen all your hopes you may have had to play a baron because while they are on the map, they will not actually be playable, and baronies can never be split from their de jure counties. It sounds disappointing at first, but at the same time, there probably is not a single person in the world that enjoyed having to fight for individual baronies in Crusader Kings 2, so getting rid of that, you know, it kind of gets rid of a non-fun mechanic. Regardless, the map is absolutely gorgeous to look at and now allows for the first time to siege baronies out of order, likely making Vikings even stronger than they were in CK2. Developers were also extraordinarily enthusiastic about nested tooltips that will make an appearance for the first time in any Paradox Development Studio game in CK3. This means that a tooltip will have marked words in it, which will then open another tooltip, which will then have marked words in it, which will then open another tooltip and so on and so forth. Especially new players should have a much easier time to learn the game uh, with a much needed expansion on accessibility provided by this system. One of the most critically received topics of the screenshots we have gotten so far is without a doubt the UI. It looks cleaner and slicker than the CK2 UI, a bit more streamlined and without any of the old charm of, you know, the religious interfaces. 
The characters are also no longer surrounded by the well-liked ruler rings and it is fairly tough these days to tell what kind of title they are actually holding. While the visuals of the UI are clearly debatable, the UI in itself is at least functionally practically the same with only small differences that could trip up experienced CK2 players. The UI could go through some major reworks until the games is released, but it will easily be moddable either way thanks to the Yomini engine layer. Another big move on the developer's part will be the change between Peasant's Levy and Men at Arms that comes with a new knighthood system. While the player had little input outside of buildings in his personal holdings on what kind of troops he could raise, this change brings actual commanders in forms of knights and their personal levies to the table, which will be much stronger than the otherwise available peasant levy. This change already indicates much needed changes on the battle system, seeing as enemies could have a vastly different setup in their troops if they do not have the loyalty of their knights. CK2 has a high degree of battle tactics in itself already, but most players barely ever interacted with it seeing as the bigger army wins most of the time, regardless of everything else. The new way of how troops are raised and the discontinuation of standing retinues as a game concept can certainly lead to a revamp of the battle system, giving the players a higher degree of direct influence on what is going on. A higher degree of direct influence is an ongoing theme in CK3's core concepts. CK2 had many static modifiers, which the team has reportedly reworked in most instances. For example, CK2 would put a heavy malice on recently conquered territories, effectively making them useless for a long time, during which they would provide virtually no levy or money. CK3, on the other hand, has a control modifier which goes from 0 to 100 and influences how much gold and troops the player can get from that province. This control modifier can actually be influenced by the actions of the player. For example, certain lifestyle focuses can speed up the control the player has over a region he newly acquired. Another topic a lot of people have mixed feelings about are the new skill trees. These skill trees allow players to have more power over what their characters do and what people they become. While the Way of Life DLC has given players more influence over this already in the past, most of the lifestyle traits were dependent on random chance, without any influence whatsoever by the player. The new skill trees now change this by giving the player plenty of choice but also plenty of limits. The five educational aspects of Crusader Kings, Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue and Learning all have individual XP bars, meaning that players can only commit to one at a time via their lifestyle focus. It is not yet known what exactly the perks will bring, but with the high restrictions behind acquiring the experience necessary to gain additional perks, it's clear that players will play and meet highly unique and different characters every time they play a campaign in the game. While it sometimes seems prudent to have a character commit himself entirely to warfare all of his life, other times one might spend perks in, well, several different educational aspects for a more well-rounded character. An often voiced criticism so far for this feature has been the fear of making it all too gamey. While, if done wrong, there is potential for skill trees to be too gamey, the choice players now have to make for their characters are much more meaningful however, instead of just giving a flat stats boost and random chances to gain good lifestyle traits as it was back in CK2. Two options that are quite interesting but have not been talked about much at all so far in CK3 are dev favorite features, at least judging by the developers I had the pleasure to talk to. Firstly, religions will have much higher customizability with heresies allowing the player to modify them. Whether this is something mostly focused on the personal religion and beliefs of the player's character or impacts the belief of people even outside of the sphere of the player's realm is currently unknown, but it seems as though religion is a much more personal and dynamic aspect of the game in CK3. Secondly, players can invest dynastic renown likely gathered over several generations to give their family traits and genes that will become a classic symbol of their dynasty. The Habsburg Chin will likely be the most common choice by the players. In conclusion. Crusader Kings 3 is attempting the jump into the cold water of leaving its old iteration behind and rebuilding some of the beloved predecessor's foundation. The reinvention of some of the old gameplay mechanics shows much needed willingness to take risks by the development team and promises to create a game worth your while. Paradox Interactive and Henrik Farhus seem to have understood that their flagship grand strategy title has morphed into more of an RPG than a proper grand strategy game. What are your thoughts on the confirmed and rumored mechanics of the game? What would you like to see that is not currently talked about and what are your biggest fears? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel to receive notifications when more videos go live. Many thanks go out to the members supporting the channel, Sei Gaijin, Benedict and Hermann. It would not be possible without you. If you want to support the channel, you can check out the join button and see what kind of perks would be available to you in case you became a member. And with that, I just want to uh, thank you for watching the video and later, alligator.